All right, I think that we should get started. There's uh, people still joining, but we have over 50, 60 people now joined. Uh, my name is Chris Griffiths. I'm um, a board member of the ESDR and a previous president. And along with Ellie Sprecher, um, we decided a few months ago that in the, you know, the COVID era, where we were not able to have face-to-face -face meetings, and particularly our ESDR annual meeting, which was scheduled to be in Amsterdam last month, as you all know, we should maintain our connection with the ESDR community um, through education and scientific discourse and come up with this um, ESDR kitchen, which is a, every fortnight, every two weeks, we have live Zoom webinars based on the four tracks that you can see here. The recipe book, where we talk about new research techniques, sweet and sour, where there's a scientific discourse between two um, leaders in dermatology, uh, molecular cuisine, uh, which is a, another leader in dermatology talking about his or her pathway to discovery and the sort of the course of their career. And then the fourth track and the one that we're going to be discussing today is called Freshly Baked, where this is a discussion by two individuals about um, two high impact research studies which have recently been published and we believe are of tremendous interest to you as um, ESDR members. I should say that uh, the current series of um, ESDR Kitchen Events is uh, supported by Amgen and we're very grateful to them. I'm now going to hand over to uh, my fellow board member and uh, Professor of Dermatology from Queen Mary University London, uh, Professor Adela O'Toole, who's going to introduce um, our participants today. So over to you, Adele. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, so the first speaker is Maria Celeste Aragona, uh, who's a, a new PI at the Novo um, Nord. Nordisk um, Centre for Stem Cell Biology in Copenhagen. She obtained her PhD in Padova in 2012 in the Piccolo Lab and um, wrote a very nice paper in Cell then, which has been highly cited. Um, she has spent the last six years in uh, Brussels with uh, Cedric Lam Plan, funded by uh, the Human uh, Frontier Science Programme and an FNRS fellowship. Um, so she's going to talk about her uh, recent uh, first author paper in Nature, uh, showing mechanisms of stretch-mediated uh, skin expansion at single cell uh, resolution. There will be questions afterwards. You can ask questions uh, in the comments box or the question and answer uh, section of, of Zoom. Um, and we'll be monitoring that and, and we'll follow up on the questions. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present here my postdoctoral work I've done in Cedric Blampen lab about the mechanism uh, regulating stretch mediated skin expansion that is a very well known procedure currently used in plastic surgery. It enables the growth of extra skin to reconstruct almost any part of the body. It is most commonly used for breast reconstruction following a mastectomy, but also to um, repair the skin damaged by birth, defect, accident, surgical operations, or for um, aesthetic purposes. Although this technique has been used since decades in medicine, very little is known about the cellular and molecular mechanisms that are regulating uh, stretch-mediated skin expansion um, in vivo. And let me only very briefly remind you that the othermost layer of the skin is the interfollicular epidermis, the IFE. It is a stratified structure maintained by the cells that are located in the basal layer and that express keratin-14. Basal cells are the only proliferating cells in the tissue and are able to give rise to all the upper layers. There is a constant flux of cells as other layer cells are continuously shed off and replaced by the inner cells that are all arising from the basal compartment. Thus, each division of a basal keratinocyte can have three different cell fate outcome, symmetric cell fate or self renewal generating two identical cells, asymmetric cell fate generating one differentiated cell or symmetric differentiation. To maintain the tissue, the majority of the divisions leads to asymmetric cell fate, while the symmetric divisions are balanced at the population level to fix the number of cells that we have in the tissue. 
but during expansion, new skin must be formed, and so the number of the newly generated cells should be bigger than the number of cells that are lost through differentiation. The aim of this project is to try to understand how this can happen in a mouse model of stretch-mediated uh, expansion. The expanders that we are using are self-inflating hydrogels that are also used in humans. They are um, designed to absorb the uh, body fluid from the animal and they are uh, growing to a predefined shape and size. We are using hemispheres that reach their maximal size in a couple of days, causing the expansion of the interfollicular um, epidermis. We can quantify the stretching of the tissue by measuring the um, area and the density of the basal cells that are massively stretched already at day one and respond to this stretching by increasing their proliferation rate as seen by BRDU incorporation from day two to day four. Later on, we also see an increase in epidermal thickness and increase in stratification, suggesting that at later stage, proliferation is still coupled with differentiation. All these morphological changes are reflected in the clone composition when we trace the basal cells with the keratin-14 promoter and the confetti um, reporter, as you can see here in the confocal images. And we have uh, experimental clones that are increasing in their basal as well as total clone size. However, this uh, increment is not compensated by a significant reduction of the clone survival as it is normally happening during uh, homeostasis, suggesting that the stretch-mediated expansion induces an imbalanced cellular fate towards self-renewal. Then Professor Ben Simons from University of Cambridge had a closer look at the clone uh, composition and he uh, realized that there is a significant bias for clones having an even number uh, of cells and you can visualize it here in the clone size uh, distribution that has uh, this peculiar uh, Christmas tree uh, shape. This was um, present in the control but it is more evident in the uh, expanded condition. So to account for this odd even event, we uh, propose uh, an arrangement in which basal cells are organized as a mosaic of doublet with one basal cell being primed for renewal and we call it stem cell and the other uh, committed to differentiation via a round of terminal division. In this model, the differentiation of the committed cell is always compensated by the division of the stem cell partner within the same unit or between neighboring units, a feature that is enriched during expansion. So by modeling the clonal data, we can infer that stretching induces a, a bias towards the renewal activity of the stem cells, while another subpopulation of basal progenitors remain committed to differentiation. To verify the existence of this heterogeneity in the basal uh, compartment, we um, perform single cell RNA sequencing by sorting basal cells with uh, interbin alpha 6 i and CD34 um, negative markers. So in control, we were able to identify um, a cluster here in red that we call a stem cell. Uh, they uh, express a high level of keratin-14. They are positive for cyclin D2 and for basal integrins. Then we see a, a population of cells that express genes associated with differentiation like keratin-1 and keratin-10 here in green, but also we were able to identify an intermediate population of uh, cells that express intermediate level of uh, um, basal as well as early differentiation markers, and we identified as the uh, committed cell uh, population. In expansion at day one, we um, identify additional heterogeneity. We have cells that uh, start to express gene associated with stress and hyperproliferation like keratin-6 here in this uh, black cluster uh, at the bottom, but also a very interesting cluster of stem cells that we call a stem cell-like stretch that uh, uh, express um, high level of uh, um, transcription factors related to the AP1 family, like FOS and June, as well as downstream target of the YAP signaling pathway, such as CIR61, uh, suggesting that only a fraction of the stem cells present a transcriptional response to mechanical stretching. We performed also pseudotemporal ordering of the cells in control. We see the homeostatic path that starts from the stem cell 
pass through the committed stage and terminate in the more differentiated cells. In expansion on day one, we were able to infer another route of uh, specification going through the um, stress uh, state, drawing the response to mechanical cues. Immunostaining confirmed the overexpression of AP1 members like June that I'm showing you here, but also of uh, FOS and fos like one at the protein level. And we also verified that stretching induces the nuclear relocalization of two of the most famous and popular mechanotransducers, YAT and MAL, with uh, more than 15% of basal cells relocalizing YAP or MAL in the nucleus, and almost all cells uh, being positive for nuclear YAP and or MAL at day four. We then used two different pharmacological uh, inhibitors, uh, tramethinib and pimazertib, to demonstrate that MECRC AP1 regulates stretch-induced proliferation, and we functionally validate the role of uh, YAP signaling by deleting YAP um, in the basal compartment. We saw a decrease in proliferation that is in particular uh, affecting the self-renewing um, division demonstrating that YAP signaling regulates stem cell behavior also uh, in vivo. It is the same for uh, MAL-SRF signaling when we use an inhibitor. Again, uh, MAL-SRF activity, we saw a decrease in proliferation. And then when we perform single cell RNA sequencing uh, with, the skin, with the expanded skin treated with this uh, MAL-SRF inhibitor, we um, can see that um, there is a decrease in heterogeneity and a decrease in the abundance of the cluster of the stem cell-like uh, stretch. We then wanted to assess the role of the actomyosin cytoskeleton um, in sensing the stretching and um, to do so, we decided to inhibit two of the most um, uh, potent uh, um, um, cytoskeletal remodelers that are diaphanous 3 and myosin 2A and we deleted specifically in the basal uh, compartment. Upon diaphanous 3 and myosin 2A deletion, uh, we uh, saw a reduction in uh, proliferation and we also verified that diaphanous 3 and myosin 2A are required for the nuclear relocalization of YAP and uh, MAL upon stretching. So um, to conclude, I want to highlight some uh, few take-home messages. In here, we define and describe the model in which we can uh, um, uh, use this system to study skin stretching and mechanotransduction in vivo in a clinically relevant context. We see that basal cells have functionally different cellular state. We demonstrated that mechanical stretching induces skin expansion by promoting the renewal of the epidermal stem cells and that cell contractility act upstream of YAP and MAL-SRF pathways to regulate stretch-mediated self-renewal in vivo. Since the paper is uh, published, I will be very happy to discuss further data that I did not have the time to present uh, here um, today. And uh, I want to finish by saying uh, thank you to all the people that helped me in the last uh, six uh, years in uh, Brussels. My boss, Cedric Blampan, because he believed in me and in the project. All the members of the team, especially Milan Malfe a PhD student that uh, unfortunately was the only one missing when we took the group picture. Alejandro C. Freeman, Thierry Vogt from Keulhoven with the help for the single cell analysis. Professor Ben Simon from uh, Cambridge, not only because he modeled himself uh, the um, clonal data, but also be, because he really spent a lot of time uh, troubleshooting the experiments with me. And I will just add that I recently uh, moved to Copenhagen to establish my lab. So uh, if you are interested in the mechanobiology and uh, in the connection between the stem cell dynamic, I will be uh, very happy if you just uh, drop me uh, an email and uh, we can discuss about it. And thank you all for the attention. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Maria Celeste. Um, Questions and answers, please, in the chat or question and answer function on Zoom. Uh, we'll move on to the second talk and we'll have the questions and answers uh, afterwards. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Jeremy uh, Di Dimizio, who did his PhD in Grenoble in France in the laboratory of Lawrence Chaperot, um, obtained in 2009. 
he then did a postdoc in immunology in uh, Texas. And since 2013, he's been a, a research scientist at uh, the uh, University Hospital in Lausanne. Um, he has published some very nice papers over the years in PNAS and uh, Nature Immunology. And he received the Cell Gene Inflammatory Skin Award in 2019. Um, he's going to talk today about his uh, recent paper published in Nature Immunology uh, on commensal skin microbiotica uh, tri um, triggering um, innate repair in, in injured skin. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you there for the nice introduction and thank you for the invitation uh, for presenting uh, my work uh, uh, recently published in Nature Immunology. So talking about wound, um, wound healing response, we can divide this response into three phases. First, an inflammation phase that uh, occurs within the first 24 hours after injury which is followed by a proliferation phase in which keratinocytes and fibroblasts will proliferate to repair the wound. And this response is finished by a matrix remodeling phase uh, that can take uh, several months. And what we showed several years ago is that plasma saturated dendritic cells or PDCs producing taproin teflon, they infiltrate the injured skin during the inflammation phase. And this step is very important for the wounding response, because if we block this step, then we observe the delayed in the wound uh, closure. So following this study, we had several questions that remain to be answered. First, uh, what, is, uh, what does recruit PDC to the injured skin? Then second, what does activate PDC to produce taproin teflon? And third, how this uh, PDC derived taproin teflon can promote the wound repair response. So to answer this question, we use several models. In the mouse, we use the tap stripping model, which remove the epidermal layers uh, by tap stripping. And in the human, we used a skin blister induction model by negative pressure that can detach the epidermis from the dermis, leading to acute inflammation. So due to lack of time, uh, I will summarize the first uh, part of this study in which have shown that neutrophils are the first cells to infiltrate the injured skin and they produce CXL10. CXL10 is a chemokine that can attract PDCs. So uh, let's switch to the second question, which is how PDC are activated. So first we investigated the, the role of uh, the DNA sensors to like receptor 9, which is the main uh, receptor for PDC to be activated with. And as you can see following injury of the skin, we can detect the expression of interferon. And this interferon was abrogated in the absence of TR9. The same if we injected directly 6 and 10 into the dermis to recruit PDCs, this is sufficient to induce interferon expression by PDCs and the absence of TR9, uh, we observed a, a complete abolished expression of interferon, uh, suggesting that PDC uh, can recognize DNA in the injured skin. So how do we, uh, what do we know about TR9 activation in PDCs? Well, actually TR9 is expressed in endosomes so it can detect the presence of microbial DNA upon infection, like infection by viruses, for example. However, its location in endosomes uh, doesn't allow the recognition of extracellular DNA. However, in the presence of cationic proteins, like antimicrobial proteins or AMP, those cationic proteins can bind DNA and form complexes, and those complexes can be taken up by PDCs, triggering TR9 and the activation of PDCs. So we have shown this mechanism with uh, several uh, antimicrobial peptides like uh, L37, lysosome, alpha defensins, those are produced by neutrophils, or beta defensins that are expressed by epithelial cells. And here, as we have shown that neutrophils produce CXL10 and that CXL10 has been shown to have antimicrobial activity, we wondered whether uh, it could also behave the same way than other AMPs. So first, we check whether CXL10 could complex DNA. For this, we use a packer green assay. It's a dye that can stain free DNA. 
And as you can see, in the presence of 6 and 10, uh, we observed a decrease of the stainability of the DNA by the dye, uh, suggesting the formation of complexes. And those complexes were disrupted if we added the anionic molecule heparin, uh, indicating that there is a charge interaction between DNA and 6 and 10. And as the cationic charges in 6 and 10 are um, harbored by uh, arginine residues, we also uh, treated 6 and 10 with butanidium, which can modify the arginine residues. And doing so, we could uh, create a 6 and 10 that has a no longer DNA binding capacity. So looking at the structure of 6 and 10, here it's a dimer of 6 and 10, we observe that the arginine residues are located in a different site than the 6R3 binding site of uh, the molecule, suggesting that the butanidium 6 and 10 uh, may retain its chemotactic activity. And indeed, by injecting uh, this 6 and 10 butanidium treated uh, molecule in the dermis of mice, we could still recruit PDCs as much as does the white up 6 and 10. However, we couldn't uh, induce the expression of interferon alpha anymore, suggesting that the formation of complexes between 6 and 10 and DNA is important to stimulate PDCs. So the next question was, what is the source of that DNA? that can stimulate PDCs. So two hypotheses here, either the DNA comes from dying uh, endothelial cells or um, from the microbiota. Indeed, when we stain for um, bacterial 16S by a fish staining, we observe the presence of common cell bacteria at the surface and within the epidermis in the uninjured skin. However, following injury and disruption of the epithelial barrier, we observed an accumulation of those bacteria in the dermis uh, in contact with the immune infiltrate. So to assess the role of these bacteria in the activation of PDCs, we used uh, two methods, either germ-free mice that are devoid of any uh, microbe or topical treatment with a polyantibiotic cream that can deplete locally uh, the common cell bacteria. So doing so, and uh, looking at the interferon induction following injury, we found that in germ-free mice, there was no more induction of interferon alpha compared to SPF mice. However, this induction could be restored by recolonizing the germ-free mice with the full skin microbiota from SPF mice. And the same with the topical treatment with polyantibiotic. Uh, antibiotic treated mice um, didn't show any induction of interferon alpha but this could be restored by recognizing those mice with the full skin microbiota from SPF mice. So this means that skin microbiota is important to induce interferon. So then we wanted to know whether specific strains of bacteria could uh, induce this interferon. So we first profiled the microbiota by 16 and sequencing to detect the different strains present in the injured skin of mice we found actually that more than 80% of uh, the bacteria were from the Staphylococcus uh, family, among which Staphylococcus xylusus was the main um, member of uh, this family in the injured skin of mice. So then we uh, recolonized germ-free mice with those different strains and assessed the induction of interferon following injury. And as you can see, we found that several strains of Staphylococcus like Staphylococcus xylosus, Saprophyticus, and Epidermidis were very good at inducing interferon uh, more than the other strain uh, tested. This could be explained by the fact that 6 and 10 had a very good capacity to kill uh, those uh, Staphylococcus strains compared to the other strains. And uh, what we also observed by electron microscopy is that 6 and 10 was able to enter bacteria and to bind DNA inside bacteria before the bacteria are lysed and uh, releasing bacterial DNA sex and complexes. And those um, complexes are highly stimulatory. As you can see here, bacteria treated by sex were very potent to induce interferon by PDCs, but not host cells treated with sex so is it the uh, same in human skin? So to answer this question, we decided to treat our volunteers with uh, Neosporin on one arm for three days before the induction of the blister and uh, with vehicle cream uh, on the other arm. Then we assessed the production of interferon alpha in the blister fluid. 
And as you can see, we could detect high levels of interferon in the control booster. However, treatment, pre-treatment with antibiotics completely abrogated the induction of this interferon alpha. More interestingly, we found that the levels of interferon alpha produced was positively correlating with the, the amount of bacterial DNA contained in the blister, but not with the amount of host DNA. So in this part, we have seen that uh, microbial DNA is stimulatory for PDC because uh, six cell 10 is killing the bacteria. But what about this interferon? How does it promote the wound repair response? So to answer this, we used a wound closure um, assay in which we measure the, the closure of wounds uh, in germ-free mice or germ-free mice recognized with a bacterial strain here, Staphylococcus. And as you can see, the recognition with Staph could uh, enhance the, the wound closure rate uh, that you can see here. And this uh, increased rate of wound closure could be explained by the induction of an increased expression of several growth factors uh, following recognition, like FGF2, FGF7, TGF beta, and VTFA. And those growth factors were dependent on PDC derived type 1 interferon because we observed a, a decreased expression of those factors in the PDC depleted BDSA2 detail mice and in uh, mice that are deficient for the IFNAR signaling. Um, interestingly, when we uh, directly stimulated human skin uh, with interferon alpha, we could induce the expression of those growth factors, indicating that uh, resident cells in the skin can directly respond to interferon alpha. So to um, determine what are those cells, we isolated the different cell types we could find in uh, healthy skin. So uh, CD45 positive immune cells, CD45, CD206 positive macrophages, and in the CD45 negative cells, CD90 positive fibroblast, CD31 endothelial cells, and double negative epithelial cells. We stimulated them with interferon alpha, and we observed that fibroblasts were the main responders uh, producing FGF2, FGF7, and VGFA in response to interferon alpha, and dermal macrophages were responding uh, by producing TGF beta. This was confirmed by immunofluorescence of injured skin. As you can see, vimentin positive fibroblasts uh, were producing VHF2 upon injury, and CD206 positive macrophages could produce TGF beta upon injury. So we have seen, we have shown that the host can explode the presence of common cell bacteria, leading to the production of type 1 deformed that can enhance the production of growth factors by resident cells this will accelerate the wound repair. So uh, with this, I would thank uh, all the people who participated to this work and I'm happy to respond to your question. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Uh, my name is uh, Leo Eckert. I'm also an ESDR board member and I will lead this Q&A session. So we will uh, mix the questions uh, to both speakers. Uh, and I will try to read from the uh, chat and from the Q&A function of Zoom. So, so maybe let's uh, begin with a question to Maria Celeste. Uh, so actually, Chris asked, uh, would the skin expansion during pregnancy uh, be subject to the same principles? And how about slower weight gain, uh, for example, in obesity? And he also congratulated, of course, uh, to your very nice work. <laughs> Uh, th thank you so much and thank you also for the question. Uh, so in the lab, we uh, were actually also looking at the pregnancy. Um, I don't have really answers to say whether the same mechanism will be uh, also important for pregnancy. I'm not sure about it because in pregnancy, of course, there will be a huge um, work related to the hormones and also because pregnancy and also the, um, let's say, uh, slower or weight uh, gain and um, it's, in, in, in terms of time, is completely different. When we apply this kind of uh, stretching device, uh, we see, uh, we stretch in one day and the effect is very fast, everything is going very fast. In the case of the pregnancy and of the um, uh, gaining weight, is the time is completely different. So I'm not sure we will see yeah, the yeah. same mechanism. 
Okay. Uh, another question for you. What is the role of the hair follicles in your model? Uh, were there waves of anagen induced? So the only thing we did check was try to trace um, air follicles, different air, fo air follicles uh, population. We didn't see any effect on this, uh, nor in the upper air follicle uh, recruitment. Thank you. So now some uh, questions uh, for, for Jeremy. So one question was about uh, the role of DNA from damaged keratinocytes. Uh, does it play any role? So actually we have never tested DNA from uh, keratinocytes. When we compare bacterial DNA with host DNA, we were using uh, human PBMCs in general for the host DNA. And yeah, we have never tested specifically DNA from uh, Cartino side, so um, mm. yeah, that's a good question whether there's differences. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, also congratulations, I cannot see now who raised the question, but the question is, can you comment on the kubnerization phenomenon uh, in chronic skin disease? Is it uh, similar? Or So it, it's what we could uh, think, like in the Kubner phenomenon, um, there's a lot of uh, friction of the skin. So we may think that some bacteria may uh, get the dermis because of that friction. Uh, this, I, I, I don't have any data, uh, it's just a hypothesis. So it would be interesting to stain actually bacteria uh, with, for example, the fish staining for bacterial 16S uh, in the skin from the coronary um, areas to see if in these areas, we can find some bacterial uh, DNA uh, inside the dermis. Mm -hmm. uh, another question uh, uh, to Jeremy, uh, a technical question. So why did you use the tape stripping for mouse and the skin blister model for humans? And then more generally, are there, what are the differences between human and mouse? In this so, system. well, between human and mouse, yeah. there's many differences. But regarding the methods, actually, is two methods that uh, give us a lot of material to work with. So with the touch shopping in mice, we can have a large area of skin that is touch -trip. So then we have a lot of material to work with, especially when you do, uh, you do um, for cytometry and isolation of cells from uh, this material. And the same for the skin blister. Uh, we thought it was the best uh, model to harvest, easily harvest the cells from the blister fluid. Uh, and it's uh, something that other people are using also uh, as a model of skin injury. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions to uh, Maria Celeste. So you generated the mice, uh, the data in young mice. Would you, or have you done or anything unpublished in older mice? So actually the data that uh, we generated here, they are from P60 mice, so adult ones. Oh. Um, we did not try uh, to use younger animals, uh, but it will be nice actually to see whether there is a different response to stretching in actually in aged animals. That would be very interesting to have a look at that. Okay. Uh, there was a, another question about temporary mechanical stress versus long-term stress. How does it affect the stem cell response dynamics? Can you comment on this? Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, I am expecting that longer mechanical stretching will uh, interfere with the dynamics in a different way than what we see. Um, I still need to figure out which is going to be the best uh, system to mm -hmm. have a look at that. Yeah. May I add a, another question? In your system, there is also a wound, actually. Do you um, know if the wounding has an effect or is it, uh, can it be uh, So uh, it's re Yeah, it's really important here to understand the way uh, I uh, process the animals for the surgery. So I uh, made an incision close to the tail and then the hydrogels were put very close to the neck uh, in order to avoid to see the response of the, uh, let's say, of the wounding that was due to surgery. And also has control. Uh, I was using animals that were operated exactly in the same way, but that 
uh, in which we just, uh, I did not place the uh, hydrogel. So actually uh, the control animals were the animals where we were for, in which we were able to exclude the wound effect and really just look at the, at the stretching. Okay, thank you. Uh, more questions for uh, Jeremy. So one of them, does the antimicrobial or uh, uh, antibiotic treatment during surgery delay wound healing? Actually, if we um, think about uh, what we have found with the mouse uh, treat, uh, antibiotic treatment in mice, um, this will definitely delay the wound healing. But in surgery, um, one point is also to avoid infection. So uh, it's hard to say you shouldn't treat with antibiotic, but maybe to reduce the time frame um, in which you are treating uh, to not to delay too much the wound healing. Yeah. Uh, another question, is there any bacterial DNA specific sequence associating with, with uh, CXCL10? So this we haven't checked whether it's binding to a specific sequence. Um, by comparing, actually, when we compare side by side host DNA and uh, bacterial DNA, the binding seems similar. I, I don't see any difference in the binding. So. I would think there's no sequence dependent effect. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, do, do, uh, is there any, um, uh, what would you think is the translational potential of this study? Would you recommend to change the microbiome or would you rather suggest to do interferon or other treatments with defined substances? Exactly, like for uh, patients with chronic ulcers who have uh, difficulties to heal wounds, uh, yeah, the idea would be to find a consortium of uh, good common cell bacteria that would promote the wound healing. Uh, mm. Yeah, that, that would be the idea, and it's what we're going to work on actually in the following years. Okay, thank you very much. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid I have overlook or I've, I have not seen all the questions because there are quite several but I guess you will will be able to answer later if, if people from the audience uh, address you maybe uh, uh, directly and I think for reasons of time I have to close the questions and answers sessions thank you very much and I think Chris will have a few more comments thank you Yeah, well, thank you so much, um, Leo and Adele, for chairing that session. And thank you for, to, for two fabulous um, talks, which have tremendous clinical relevance from Jeremy and Mary Celeste. Um, the next ESDR um, uh, webinar, the next ESDR visit, visit to the kitchen, will be one of our sweet and sour um, themes, which is a scientific discourse where two eminent dermatologists or researchers in skin biology take opposite sides of, of a view. And we have found people from, you couldn't have a greater time difference between these two guys. There's, there's Rich Gallo from Sa uh, San Diego in the United States and Scott Byrne from Sydney in Australia talking about the role or otherwise of vitamin D in inflammation. So thank you for tuning in today and um, we look forward to welcoming you again in two weeks time on the 28th of October. Okay, goodbye for now.